Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Chris Tidrick, um, and today we are going to uh, talk about um, garden photography and some tips and tricks on how to take take better uh, garden and landscape photos. Um, I am the uh, by day I am the IT director for U of I Extension, um, but uh, in my free time I'm a, a pretty uh, pretty in depth photographer. I've been uh, doing photography for about 15 years now, um, particularly landscape and garden photography. Um, and so hopefully uh, by the end of the session today you will uh, have some new, uh, new ideas and ways of uh, taking garden photos that you didn't have uh, when you started today. Um, I want to ask that you uh, ask questions at the end of the session. Normally you want to do this um, in person. There's a lot of interactivity um, throughout the session, but I think that might be the logistics of doing it online. Might, that might be a little difficult, um, but I'd be happy to take questions at the end of the session. Uh, one of the things that I want you all to leave with today is the idea that um, no matter what camera you have, you can be a good photographer. There's a photographer whose name was Chase Jarvis, and um, he had a quote. It said, the best camera is the one that you have with you. And what he really means by that is if, if you think that you're not going to take a picture just because your camera is not a good camera, um, and you don't, ha you don't have what you think is a good camera, then um, you're missing out on that opportunity to capture that image that you see or capture that memory um, or whatever it might be that you're, you're trying to, to capture with your camera. Um, the one that you have with you is the best one. So don't kind of stick yourself out and think you can't take good pictures just because um, you don't have the, the most high-end camera in the world. With that said, um, I want to talk about three different kinds of cameras that you might see on the market today. Um, one is what's called a digital SLR, um, which uh, there's a picture of it up on the screen there. Um, this happens to be a Nikon. Canon makes a really good digital SLRs as well. Um, what SLR stands for is a single lens reflex camera, and essentially you're looking through the viewfinder, through the lens, and seeing what the lens is seeing. Um, that's really the only type of camera where you're doing that, where you're actually looking through the lens. All other cameras are kind of digital representations of what the lens is seeing. Um, these tend to be um, the most expensive cameras on the market and do give you more options with what you can do with your photography, especially with manual focus and some of the more advanced settings. Um, but you don't have to have one of these type of SLR cameras in order to do, take really good photography. Another kind of camera is what I think the, the industry kind of calls point and shoot. Um, I, I kind of affectionately call these candy bar cameras. Um, because they're small enough to fit in your pocket. And some of these, these point-and-shoot cameras have really come a long way as far as the, the quality of the photos that they can take. And with that, it, they're so small, so portable, that you're a lot more likely to take them with you um, instead of dragging out a big SLR that has detachable lenses and things like that, where in, in my case, I've got like four detachable lenses for my digital SLR, so I have to carry a backpack around um, for the camera. A candy bar camera or a point-and-shoot camera is one that you're just going to you know, stick in your pocket or stick in your purse um, and carry with you. So you're much more likely to have that with you. Now, probably the most popular type of camera on the market today is... Um, your camera, your smartphone, um, or some other some other sort of phone device that has a camera built into it, and um, these have become. I, I would estimate that more than 50% of the digital photos that are taken today are taken with a camera phone, and some of them have gotten so good that they are a re replacement um, for a camera. So uh, I would say that now. Um, since I got an iPhone 6, which is kind of the newest iPhone, the camera lens in that iPhone 6 is so good that I take about half of my photos, um, and I'm really serious about taking photos, but I take about half of my photos now with my iPhone and the other half with the digital SLR. So really uh, what I want you to remember is that regardless of what type of camera that you have, um, the things that we're going to talk about today, you can uh, take really uh, quality photos with. So the first concept that I want to uh, really introduce to you is that your gardens always have something to offer. 
Um, sometimes we think that the only time that we want to take pictures of our garden is in the spring when all the, the bulbs are blooming and there's all these bursts of color and um, the tulips and the daffodils and you know the, the crab apples blooming and the lilacs blooming. And it's this really gorgeous time of year in our gardens. And so we rush out there and we take all these kind of pictures in the spring and then we, we put our cameras down and don't think about our gardens for the rest of the year as far as photography is concerned. But what I want to tell you is that the garden really always has something to offer. So, you know, as we transition from spring into summer, there's all kinds of color in the summer garden um, that you can go out there and photograph. And, and that's pretty straightforward. But then as we, trans um, as we go into fall, um, you know, there's some amazing color in the garden um, as, you know, as far as the, the reds and the oranges and the um, you know, the golds and the yellows. That This picture that you see up there, the fall color picture, is actually a spruceberry in my former garden. And that tree would turn different colors every single, every single season, whether we had a dry season or a wet season or it got cold early or it stayed warm long. Um, that, that shrub really um, was, gave me a completely different picture each and every year. The year that I took this picture, um, it almost the leaves almost turned bronze when it, traditionally they kind of turned orange. Um, so it, it really does. Even if thought, if you, even if you think, hey, I've taken a picture of that service berry in the past, go out in there and look at it again um, this year and see what see what it has to offer. And the last season, winter, um, a lot of us, you know, uh, stay in, inside, indoors in the wintertime and really don't visit our gardens. But I would encourage you, um, get, get outside in the wintertime and take pictures of your winter garden. And if you've planted a garden that has visual interest in the winter, uh, you can find some really interesting things uh, to photograph. One example of this is um, you, you might not think of roses as um, as a winter interest uh, plant, uh, but I want to I want to encourage all of you to you know be really mindful of what is right in front of you during all seasons when you're taking your garden photos. Um, there's uh, kind of a, a renewed interest in the idea of mindfulness um, in uh, in society today about the, the the concept that we if we're remembering what our spring garden looked like or looking forward to what our summer garden is going to look like, uh, we're not mindful of what is actually out there in the moment right in front of us. So I'm going to give you an example of this was um, a couple of winters ago um, on January 21st. And if you remember a couple of winters ago, we had a brutal winter here in central Illinois or I think Illinois overall. And it was one of those winters where you just wanted to stay under a blanket on the couch and read a good book. You just didn't want to go outside. Um, but we had a day when it got up to 25 degrees. And I was like, yes, it's finally time to get outside um, and take some pictures. But I normally would take pictures at least once a month or once a week in the, in the wintertime in my garden. And I hadn't been out there virtually the entire winter because it was so cold and nasty. So the, win the, the temperatures rose a little bit. So I grabbed my camera and went out. And I decided to focus on roses. And you wouldn't think roses were a real winter interest plant. But if you look, you know, roses, some of the roses have um, really beautiful hips. Um, this is actually a rainbow knockout rose, which has, you know, these really you know, bright orange hips on it. They're not super big. Um, I was uh, just in Newport, Rhode Island this past week on vacation, and there, the, all the cliffs in Newport are covered in um, rugosa roses, and the tips on those things are the size of small crab apples. And uh, I could just only imagine what those look like in the middle of winter. Um, then the foliage of the roses. In the middle of winter, there was a snow cover on the ground. Um, so I took this kind of silhouette image of just the remaining foliage and the thorns and stems on the rose. That fall, we had had a really late um, warm spell in the fall, so the roses kept blooming all the way into December, but we got really hard, fast freeze, and so a lot of the, the knockout roses had buds still on them when we got our first freeze, and so um, this, this picture was actually kind of a flash frozen rosebud, um, and it was still very beautiful even in January. And another example here is um, 
I shot a I shot a picture down the one of the stems of of the rose, and you can just see the, kind of that whirl of thorns. Um, so on a day when you might have been thinking, oh, it's a day that the, the garden has nothing to offer, I went out and found quite a bit of beauty in the garden um, on this kind of unlikely day. Another um, aspect of garden photography is always um, learning to change your point of view. Um, one of the things that we, I think we do as photographers or just kind of as human beings in general is we walk around looking at things from our point of view and we don't change that point of view. So if you, when you walk through your garden without a camera, you're seeing it from your height. So whether you're five feet or six feet, you're seeing it from your height. And that's how the garden looks to you all the time. I would encourage you when you're taking pictures of your garden that you, you change your point of view because then the photos that you could take are going to look different than those things you see day in and day out. They're going to be more interesting. Uh, the picture that's up here on the screen right now is a a uh, Asiatic lily um, called Anastasia, and it's a downward hanging um, lily. So the, the trumpet of the lily points towards the ground, and the stamens and anthers um, kind of hang there um, and down towards the ground. If I was standing up, you know, I'm six feet tall. If I'm standing up above this, all I'm seeing is the backside of that trumpet. It's not a very interesting flower. So for this one, I actually laid down on the ground um, underneath this and shot it up. You get the really clear blue sky behind it. It's a much more interesting, much more beautiful. Um, I always think about when when I'm taking a picture, would this look really good hanging on a wall? And this, you know, this picture would have looked spectacular hanging on a wall um, versus if I had shot um, from my normal perspective. Um, one of the advantages of this um, is that this lily also has amazing fragrance, and when you lay down underneath it, the fragrance kind of spills over top of you. So um, th there's more to uh, changing your point of view than just uh, getting better pictures. Another example of changing your point of view, um, this was a dahlia, and um, it had the blackest, most glossy sepals um, that, that you'd ever seen on a um, on a, that I'd ever seen on a dahlia before. Um, and I actually thought the back side of it was more interesting than the front side of it. So I turned it around, shot that, and kind of brought up the, the shadow levels um, on, when I got the photo onto my computer to make this really kind of um, outstanding. You get the, that salmon red color, but up against those glossy black sepals. So it's a, to me, it was a more interesting, uh, more unique photo from, from the back side. Another example of changing your point of view, um, this was uh, one view of my former garden. And it, um, if I had shut this straight on um, and standing at six feet tall, it wouldn't have looked very interesting. What I've done here is I got down on one knee, shot down the length of a retaining wall, um, and got a little bit more of a, um, an angle on it. It makes it a much more interesting picture by getting down at the garden's level. This is another example of shooting from the side rather than shooting straight on. Um, you get you get some feeling of depth. This was a window box at the Chicago Botanic Garden that they had planted with uh, shard, parsley, and snapdragons. Um, I thought it was a really interesting combination in the planting, um, and I wanted to take a picture of it. But straight on, you just didn't get a real um, a real feel um, for what that looked like. So changing my point of view, getting down at the, the level of the window box and shooting along the length of the window box made it, a um, to me, a more interesting picture. Another um, thing, to, another tip um, for taking garden photography is to get wet. Um, and by that, I mean take photos of your garden um, when it's wet. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to wait for it to rain. Um, I would often go out and take photos in my garden after I had the sprinklers on. Um, or even if I wanted to really stage it, just bring a sprinkle hose out or a, one of those ho handle hoses and just you know wet the foliage a little bit before I took pictures. Because you can really get outstanding photos when you have water droplets on certain types of plants. Um, 
this uh, one of my favorite uh, perennial plants is daylilies. So I had tons of them in my garden, um, and sometimes I get kind of tired of photographing them because you know, there's only so many ways you can take a, a daylily. But then one day it had rained and I went outside and I saw this um, daylily, which was a little bit hard to photograph dry um, because the the apricot color was a little mu too muted to get a really good photo of it. Um, but with the water droplets on it, it really kind of popped right out. The color really popped. The yellows came out. Um, and it was a much, a much better photo than if it hadn't been wet. Another plant that I find really hard to photograph uh, when, it's, when it doesn't have water droplets on it is caladium, which you see here in the bottom of this photo. Um, it has, you know, it's really beautiful. You can see the veining in the, in the plant and the kind of the modeling. It's a really beautiful caladium, um, but it never came out like a really sharp picture. It was always kind of a muddy picture. Um, you get those water droplets on it to give it some dimension. Um, and it brings out it brings out the color, it brings out the texture of the leaf quite a bit more. Um, this is a, another example of this is probably one of my favorite photos I've ever taken of a white peony um, right after it had rained. And uh, the whites can be a little difficult to get the right exposure on when you're when you're taking photos. But for some reason, the uh, the water droplets on this almost made it look like it was diamond studded. Um, and it, it really turned into a great, um, a great photo just by having those water droplets on it. So, you know, get wet when you're um, out there photographing. Another thing to do is grab the light, um, and this is this might be one of the more important things uh, or most important things uh, when you're when you're doing photography. If you want to have really dramatic photography, is the idea of making sure that you have the right light. And you'll hear, you'll hear people talk about the golden hour. Um, in the golden hour, um, there's really two golden hours each day. Um, it's right after the sun has come up and right as the sun is going down. Um, depending on the time of year, that, that hour will shift. Um, but it's kind of the hour right before um, sunset and the right hour right after sunrise is you get this really warm uh, color in the garden. And so um, I, that's one of my favorite times to, to photograph. Uh, my former garden had an eastern exposure in the morning and a western exposure at night. Um, so I really got uh, great light through that garden. Um, this, this photo is of an alocasia that's called Mayan mask. And when I bought it, um, I, the photo on the, on the plant tag looked amazing. The, the plant itself didn't look great. And, but I took a chance on it, and it for a while it's kind of this kind of muddy lime green plant. I wasn't really impressed by it. Um, I was kind of wondering why I had just spent fifteen dollars on this thing. And then one night after work, I went out into the um, the back garden, and the the sunset light had hit this Mayan mask, and ju it just exploded um, in color and light. And you can see from the photo is this you know really. Um, kind of special, the, the spotting in it almost gives kind of a constellation effect around the veins. Um, but you just don't, you'd never see that if you weren't kind of get out there grabbing that, that special moment when the light was just perfect on it. Again, daylilies, one of those things that I like to shoot in a multitude of different ways because I have so many of them in the garden. Um, and the I, red daylilies are my favorites, um, especially those with yellow throats. And you can see from this picture why that's the case. Um, what what I, When you get that, um, this is evening light. This was one that was in my, my backyard garden. And the evening light just explodes um, in a red daylily. And so I shot it from behind. So I can kind of see that illumination through um, through the petals of the daylily, and this is even a daylily that you can kind of see it was a little bit past its prime. You can see some of the kind of aging wrinkles on the edge of the petals, but it still makes this really dramatic photo um, of the daylilies. And you might you might be wondering, did you get that right off of your camera? Um, and I, I'm like, no, I didn't. There's some post processing done on on both of these images, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. This is um, an example of the golden hour in the morning. Um, these ferns and uh, grasses in a shade garden that was on the south side of uh, my former garden. And it's 
um, this is the morning light coming in through the fence and illuminating these ferns. Uh, these ferns really are nothing to look at um, if, in the height of the day, but in the morning and the evening when you get that low light coming through them, they really, it's almost as if someone has just spotlight them in the garden. Um, so really look for those times of the day um, where the light is really good. Um, there, there are people that will tell you, photographers that will tell you, never shoot at high noon, never shoot between 10 and 2 p.m. Um, I tend to ignore that. Um, it's harder to shoot um, in the middle of the day because the shadows are really harsh um, from the overhead sun, but that doesn't mean you can't shoot. Um, it all depends on the type of plants you're shooting and uh, the type of landscapes you're shooting. Um, but you, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to shoot overall landscape photos rather than close-ups, um, it's sometimes better to have an overcast day um, to shoot on because you don't have to deal with all the shadows. Um, but I think if you look at all three of these photos, these three photos all take advantage of the shadows and the highlights um, to create that kind of drama in the photo. What photography really does, um, for me at least, um, and kind of my philosophy as a photographer is we're not just taking pretty photos. We're, we're trying to tell a story. We're trying to evoke an emotion um, when we take these photos. You know, we take them so we can remember. And um, if there's no story behind your photo or no emotion behind your photo, it really is little more than just a pretty picture to hang on your wall. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you, when you have the ability to tell that story, evoke that emotion, really bring up that memory in people, then it's, to me, it's a much more powerful photo. So this photo up here at the top is a, uh, a piece of uh, garden art that I have. And I, like, I tend to like this more rustic um, iron, uh, rusted iron garden art um, more than any other art. I don't have a whole lot of art in my garden. But um, this one, I liked it. It was a nice piece. Um, but this day, was um, it was in the middle of December. It was 31 degrees, and it was raining. And so you can imagine it was kind of this miserable day. And so I, when I went out, I you know I wanted to see. I saw there was a lot of water droplets gathering on things, and I thought those might that might make some interesting pictures. But when I came upon this one, it struck me as that is the that captures the story of today. It's just this drippy, nearly frozen day. And so you get the, the water droplets forming icicles off the side of this uh, dragonfly sculpture. Um, and that kind of told that story that, of, of that day. Another thing you can do with photography in your gardens is kind of to tell the story of change. You know, in the fall, we'll take a lot of pictures of the, uh, the pretty leaves, um, you know, in these full, full you know, trees in full glory of reds and yellows and oranges and everything. But I liked this photo because it told the story of the change. This sweet gum tree um, had three sweet gums lining the driveway. Those of you who uh, have grown sweet gums know that that was kind of a nightmare to have them along the driveway. Um, but they were still there because they were really beautiful trees in the fall. And, and they turned these, like four or five different colors in the same tree. But I captured this one with, um, with half of the leaves green and half of them having changed to their fall color. To me, it told that story of we are at the beginning of fall. We're, we're starting that transition um, in the garden into fall. And also, you know, we, gardens aren't just gardens. Gardens are places where people go and interact um, and enjoy themselves. This, the picture on the, the bottom left here is a picture of my son um, when he was much younger than he is now. And he, uh, it was the first time he had ever seen a tulip. And this, if you look at the expression on his face, it's that expression of wonder, like, what is that alien-looking thing inside that flower? And you know, I think all of us have had that that reaction when we first saw the inside of a tulip and we're like, wow, that's an amazing thing. It, it almost looks like it's from another planet. And he was having that same sort of uh, reaction there, and I happened to turn around and he was doing it and, and snapped the picture. So you can, um, you can bring up that emotion and tell that story um, with, with a photo. Um, 
Also, when you're trying to tell stories with your photos, um, make sure you get the right context. And by context, you know, include those things in the frame that you need to tell the full story. And so this is an example of here's a, a photograph of a patch of uh, summer blooming allium. And it's a nice looking patch of summer blooming allium. It was, you know, covered with uh, pollinators and, you know, buzzing around. And um, it's, it's a nice picture. But it doesn't really tell the whole story of where that um, patch of allium is, what the significance of it was to me. Um, so if I back out a little bit and change the frame on the picture, that patch of allium is actually at Lurie Garden up in Chicago. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Lurie Garden, it is the largest rooftop garden in the world, or at least one. it used to be the largest. It may, it's still one of the largest for sure. It's built on top of the Millennium Garden or the Millennium Park parking garage in downtown Chicago. So underneath that are thousands of cars of people that are enjoying downtown Chicago. But it's this beautiful landscape um, designed by Payet Udoff and uh, – and so it's this really it's this beautification effort in in downtown Chicago. So by including a larger swath of plants in the garden, by including the skyline of Chicago, I am including the context around the garden of what that story really was. But that's not the end of it. the The real story that day is I was up in Chicago for a um, the Independent Garden Center show. Uh, which is a, a gardening trade show that they have out on Navy Pier. And several of the uh, people that I had met through um, social media uh, and my garden blog um, were there at the show. And I went to Lurie Garden with Steve Bender, who is the uh, senior gardening editor for Southern Living Magazine. Um, for those of you who may or may or may not know of him, Steve is known as the Grumpy Gardener um, online on the Southern Living website. And he is one of the most knowledgeable plant people I've ever met. And this morning, we took some time off from the show, and I got to tour the Lurie Garden with Steve Bender. And so including Steve in the picture in and amongst the skyline in the garden, that really tells the whole story of, of my day there. And that's the picture that really evokes that memory of what that day really was for me. There are a lot of rules. If you read photography books, there are uh, a number of rules that um, – the kind of the hardcore photographers, um, the photography purists will tell you um, to follow. And some of them have some value. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them here today because um, I, I'm kind of a rule breaker when it comes to, when it comes to photography. Um, but I would encourage you, you know, get a photography book and learn some of those rules, um, but then break them. One of the rules, um, probably the most popular rule, is the 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 rule of thirds. And um, I'm going to describe this, and you can kind of imagine this over top of this picture of these Louisiana iris that are here. Um, these Louisiana iris were in uh, P. Allen Smith's garden when I went down and visited that a couple of years ago. Um, he had a little pond, and these Louisiana iris were growing in the garden. And it's like, oh, that, that's going to be a great rule of thirds picture. Sometimes I'll think um, as I'm shooting. I'm like, oh, yeah, we've got to, you've got to shoot this way um, to get to be a, a really nice picture. And what the rule of thirds is, is if you were to draw, imagine drawing a tech toe board over top of this photo. Um, and so you have a grid with two lines down and two lines across. The places where those lines intersect are what are known as your thirds. The rule of thirds says always have your object of focus in one of those intersections underneath one of those intersections of your 3x3 three three tic-tac-toe board grid. Um, and that creates a balance that um, the, the, we found over a lot of research and studies that the human eye finds comforting. And so when people look at a photo that follows the rule of thirds, they feel, um, they feel good about the photo. It, it just, it's a natural look to them. It doesn't make them struggle to look at. So this Louisiana iris that's down here in this bottom left hand, um, kind of the, the object of focus in this photo, it's in that bottom left hand third. So, but that doesn't mean you have to take all of your pictures with the object of focus in thirds. That's just 
something that creates kind of a general pleasing um, feel to the eye. The picture on the right here completely breaks the rules of thirds. The, the object of focus in this photo is dead, almost nearly dead center in the photo. It certainly is not in one of the thirds, um, but it still is really attractive photo and one that I think you know is, is frameable, something that you'd hang on your wall. Um, so you don't necessarily have to follow the rules, uh, but it helps to know them when you're composing your photos, so that um, you know what you know what generally works, and then you can say, okay, I'm going to break that rule because of this, um, because it this one's going to look better in the center um, and not off in, into one of the thirds. If you look at any really famous photographers, you know, what, photographers that make you know can make a living um, at this art. Um, a lot of them are known for doing things that break the standard rules, um, and so you know they they certainly understood the technical parts of the rules, but they they break them on a regular basis to make themselves unique. So that's what I would that I would suggest for you all is to learn the rules and then go ahead and break them. Uh, one of the things though you'll want to do um, is make sure that your photos always have an object of focus. Um, because if you don't have something that you that the viewer of you, that you or the your view, the viewer of your photos can focus on something that their eye gets drawn towards, then your photo is kind of just this jumbled mess, um, and you're like, well, what am I supposed to be looking at? It's kind of if you think about it as the same way as we design our gardens, is we can. Um, you know, if we don't design our gardens well, when people visit our garden or when we walk through our garden, there's no place for our eye to settle. And so it, it creates this kind of chaotic feel and people don't feel comfortable. The photography is kind of the same way, that you want to have something where the, the viewer of the photo, their eye settles on something. So in this case, you've got this um, a flat plane of this fern is your object of focus. It, then points down to kind of this background of the, the birch log that's in the, the background. But the birch log is completely out of focus. If I had, hadn't told you that was a birch log, you may not even notice, note it was there. Um, but the, the fern frond is really the thing that um, is the object of focus in this particular photo. In the next photo here is bird bath. The bird bath is the thing that is in focus. Um, and the, the garden behind it all of it is completely out of focus. If you look closely at that picture, the, the garden itself is blurry, but that, that bird bath is the thing that is in focus. But your eye settles on the bird bath, but then it pulls out all the color. Um, the, the person who designed this garden, this was one of the garden walk gardens in Champaign County a few years back, um, they took the, the color out of the bird bath, or either that or chose the bird bath to match the color in their garden. But you can see there's this color echo that goes off of the bird bath back into the garden. But that object of focus, single thing that you want somebody to look at in your photo is there. It's sharp, um, and not necessarily in the foreground. In this case, it is in the foreground. Um, but you want that one thing to be sharp and in focus. And you might ask, well, how do I get things in focus um, with if I don't have a camera that I can manually focus, like an SLR? Um, on your, uh, if you have a smartphone, most of the newer smartphones, if you're framing your photo and you've got your, your, your smartphone up in front of you and you can see what you're about to take a picture of, most of those cameras now, if you touch on the thing in the photo that you want to be in focus, it'll refocus on that spot. Um, so if you haven't discovered that feature, um, try that out on your smartphone uh, because that, that is really handy. It'll also do kind of an auto exposure so your lighting and your color um, improves based on what you've selected as the object to focus. Um, some of the candy bar cameras, you can choose uh, which, which point in the, on, the, on the grid you want to have in focus as well. So you know, learn um, how your camera allows you to focus, but make sure you have that object of focus um, in the picture. Otherwise, you just kind of get this jumbled mess. Another thing, and it's, it's more of a physical, um, a physical factor in how you, when you take photography, but make sure you brace yourself um, when you're taking photos. It doesn't really matter what kind of camera you have. If your hands are moving when you take that picture, it's not going to be sharp. Um, and all of us, um, especially as we get older, um, our hands are not as steady as they used to be. Um, 
I know, me especially, if I don't get enough food, um, or if, you know, if I'm running late on a shoot and it's past lunchtime or something, my hands will start to shake a little bit. And so there's ways that you can get around um, any sort of handshake or tremor you might have to be able to take sharper photos. Um, one way is a, using a tripod. Uh, you know, this is kind of a, an old school photography tool. Um, just a standard tripod. Some of them are really lightweight now and you can carry in a bag with you um, or carry on a sling over your shoulder. And, you know, if, if handshake is an issue for you, use a tripod to, to brace the camera because if your hands are moving, um, you very rarely get an image that is really um, in, in good sharpness. Um, they also sell, um, this is a picture on the top left of a, um, a, a tripod called a gorilla pod, um, gorilla like the animal. And it, um, it'll, it screws right into the bottom of your camera. Some of them come and they're only about five or six inches tall. I have one that's about 12 inches tall. They're, they retail for anywhere between 20 and $40. Um, but it allows you to put the legs in whatever position you want to. So they're completely flexible. They'll even wrap around a pole or a small branch or the back of a chair or something and create this kind of temporary mount for your camera. Um, that is uh, my Gorilla Pod is the one that I um, carry with me um, on a regular basis. It's the one that fits right inside my camera backpack. Um, and I always have that one with me when I'm out on a shoot. Um, I very rarely carry my heavier tripod anymore. I usually just use my uh, heavier tripod for indoor um, people photography if I'm doing family photos or whatever it might be. Um, you can also get these little bitty tiny tripods um, that will hold a camera phone um, so that you can use. You can set them on a rock at a garden or set them on a garden wall or you know, set them on whatever solid surface you might have on the ground and it will steady your smartphone for you and it, your smartphone kind of just slides into the slot there. Um, if you have if you have any issues with um, with that now another thing you can do is use your own body to brace yourself so you can see this uh, the man here taking the photo he has he's using an SLR but you could use the same uh, technique with any kind of camera he's taken and he has his camera in his hands but he's taken and he's clamped his elbows down to his side what that will do is steady your hands a lot more um, if you don't have anything else to lean on Another way of doing that, you can see this woman here, she sat down and is using her knees as a brace for her arms um, for doing, um, to, for keeping herself still. Anything you can do to keep that camera steady is going to be really important for, um, for having a nice sharp photo. Uh, one of the things with the candy bar cameras and our camera phones is that we tend to, since we're not looking through a viewfinder, we're actually seeing it, we're, we, we tend to extend our arms out all the way when we're taking the photo. But what that does is that creates this fulcrum at the end of our, at the end of our arms that is really difficult to keep steady. Um, so anything you can do to keep your arms steady while you're taking pictures will dramatically improve the quality of your photos. Another thought is that backgrounds really matter. Um, so when you're taking a picture of something, make sure you, you kind of assess what is behind it because that can really make or break a photo. If you look at this photo up here on the top left, it's a planter at Ulbrich Botanical Gardens up in Wisconsin. And I chose this angle to shoot this planter because the only thing that was of color that was behind it was the, the, the flowering tree and the, the red barberry that was kind of behind it in the in the background and then everything else was green. If I, from the other angle, there was this huge perennial border that, border that was full of color, but I chose to shoot it this way because I wanted that planter to stand out against a, a more uh, drab or more monotone background versus getting lost in that um, entire cacophony of color um, in, the, in the, uh, the perennial border. Another example of backgrounds matter, this was a uh, container that I had in my garden a couple of years ago, and I nestled it up against a Colorado blue spruce um, behind it. And that, that blue-green of the blue spruce really made all of the chartreuses and the purples in that container pop. If I put that up against um, just kind of a standard green shrub, uh, the color wouldn't have popped nearly as much. Um, 
Another example, and this is a, a shot in the winter, um, this is a Japanese beauty berry um, that the berries were starting to desiccate over the course of the winter, still had a little bit of that characteristic purple color in them. But this was, um, I shot this from the top down. So the background was actually the mulch in the garden, and it's completely blurred out because of the depth of field. Of the snow. But um, my other option would have been shooting it from the side, and my neighbor's gray siding would have been the background. Now, the, the brown of the mulch is a much better background to make the ice around those uh, berries show up versus kind of a gray, which would be a very similar color to the ice. Um, so think about your backgrounds when you're shooting. Also think about finding interesting combinations of uh, shape, color, and texture. Um, those are the things that are going to make for interesting photographs. Um, so for example, this is that same, uh, that same uh, container that I showed you in the previous slide with uh, the Burgundy and Chartreuse coleus, but behind it, um, which didn't show in the other photo because it wasn't blooming yet, there was a Mona Lavender Plectranthus, which has this purple bloom to it. And later in the summer when that was blooming, that chartreuse and the purple was a really interesting combination um, that came up during the summer. So you know, think about those color combinations and those contrasts that are going to create these striking photos. Also look for serendipity in the garden uh, when you're trying to find these interesting combinations of shape, color, and texture. This was a, a Rebecca Black Eyed Susan that um, had popped up and kind of grown out and around a, um, one of a variegated uh, uh, ornamental grass. And it just kind of looked like it had, almost had its head nuzzled around um, the ornamental grass. And so it creates this kind of interesting uh, this interesting look and feel. Again, you know, when you're out shooting gardens or your own garden, look for those, you know, really interesting um, texture combinations. This was uh, the garden of uh, Ed Lyon, who is, uh, used to live up in Wisconsin. He was the uh, director of Allen Centennial Gardens at University of Wisconsin. I had a chance to go to his home garden, and it was one of the best shade gardens I'd ever seen. And his his use of shape, color, and texture in a shade garden was just uh, phenomenal. And so there were all these different pictures of um, where I could, you know, anywhere you looked, you could get a great photo um, that had really high, highly contrasting shape, color, and texture like you see in this one. Make sure that you choose the frame and the context of your, um, of your photos. If this, for example, um, this tells that story um, through the frame and context. This is a friend of mine who turned her entire front yard into a, an edible ornamental garden. Um, and this is in the suburbs of, uh, suburbs of Chicago in the Naperville area. And she ripped out her front lawn and put this in. This is the same picture or a picture of that same garden, but it could be anybody's side garden. It doesn't really tell the, the story of that um, of that garden like the full framed picture does. Make sure you choose the right angle for balance. Um, this is uh, my former garden. And if you look at this picture, um, the up in the top left hand corner, you see some of the sidewalk. It's not the best angle. But just adjusting the angle just a little bit, it's a much clear it's a much nicer picture of the garden. So make sure that you you have the balance and you have those elements in the picture that you that you want. Now Earlier, I showed some pictures where I said I had adjusted them after the fact. Um, and I want to say that the art of photography doesn't stop with a shutter click. Um, so don't feel like you can't play with your photos a little bit after you get them on your computer. Um, for example, this was a night blooming daylily that I had in my back garden. And this is the raw photo right off of the camera. Um, it was kind of low light in the evening. Um, it, there, there was no sun. It was kind of an overcast day. I took this picture, and it was OK. You know, it was wet, um, so it had a little bit of interest. But then I brought that onto my computer and pulled up the shadows. And that's the photo that I got. After just pulling up the shadows, it, it was an adjustment that took about 15 seconds for me to do. Um, and then that, that is a photo that you'd hang on your wall versus this, which is just kind of a, a kind of average photo. So y you can be artistic when you take the photo. You can be artistic when you um, are after the fact. The the tool that I use um, for all of my photo organization and editing um, is Picasa. Um, it is a a tool from Google. It's free. 
Um, if you just go to picasa.google.com, you can download it for free. It's available on PC and Mac. Um, I do virtually all of my photo editing adjustments um, and organization. It allows you to keyword things and put them into albums, upload them to your favorite uh, uh, online uh, store that will make prints for you. It's, it's a really great tool and one that I highly recommend. Um, so that's that's the only tool I use. A lot of uh, photographers will use Lightroom or Photoshop, but you really don't need those. Um, you can get by with uh, doing um, using this tool that doesn't cost you anything and is frankly a lot easier to use. So um, before I open up to questions, uh, what I really want to do is you know suggest that when you're taking photos, be yourself. Um, take those photos that that uh, look interesting to you. Um, and have your unique perspective on the world. You know, open your eyes to what is around you. Um, it's don't don't assume that there's nothing out in the garden to take pictures of. Every single day of the year, there's something in your garden that, that might be of interest to take pictures of. So make sure you open your eyes and you're not living in the past or looking forward to the the future. Break the rules. You've, uh, you know, any photography book, there will probably be, you know, 10 different rules that you should follow. You know, get one of those books, learn the rules, but then break them because that's really what makes you unique from everybody else. But above all, make sure that you tell the story um, that you're trying to tell. We take photos to remember things. Um, sometimes we take photos just because we want a pretty flower on our wall. But for the most part, we take photos to remember things. It's one of those kind of unique things as humans that we can do that other animals can't do. We can capture these things so that when we, we come back to them, they evoke um, that emotion or that, that story. Um, and so tell the story of your gardens and other gardens that you visit. Before I open it up to questions, um, I want to remind you that um, the this session and past recordings of the Four Seasons Gardening Series are on YouTube. Uh, you can see that uh, URL up on the screen, and I believe in the email that all the participants got, um, that URL is also um, on them. But at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, you can see all the places on social media uh, where you can find me, um, and also my email address and the address of the new blog that I just launched a few months ago. So with that, I will open it up to any questions. You can unmute your mics to ask your question or type it in the chat window, either way. That uh, one of the questions that came in in the chat was, "What book would you suggest to learn the rules?" Um, I actually don't have a favorite book, um, but if you search online for Digital Photography School, um, there's a website. I believe it's digitalphotographyschool.com, um, but just do a Google search on Digital Photography School. They have a lot of really good basic tutorials as well as um, more advanced things. Okay, another question is, what are some ways to use photo temperature and tint to edit your photos? Um, one of the things that um, I do a lot um, when I, and you can do this in the Google Picasa tool that I told you about, is the one, there's, on one of the panels, there's, there's four sliders. There's mid-tones, highlights, shadows, and then temperature. The temperature really is the warmth of the photo. And I will, on most of my garden photos, I will bring the temperature up a notch because it brings the, the, the red tones up a little bit. And, and those, are, the, those tend to be tones that are really uh, highly present in garden photography. So it, it creates just a little bit warmer of a picture and less, you know, it makes your white just a little bit warm um, and it tends to really pop up. Um, 
uh, pop-up garden photos. Tint, I don't really mess with as much, so I probably wouldn't um, have a whole lot to lend to that. I have a question about when uh, will I be doing my photo organization uh, presentation again. I did that in Taylorville um, in February, and uh, I would be uh, happy to do that for any uh, county that wanted to uh, have me to do that one. That was a, a more um, in-depth um, on organization and editing using the Picasso tool. So just have your... Uh, your Hort Educator Accounting Director contact me if they're interested in having me do that. I can do that one um, live or remotely. Any additional questions? Okay, well feel free, um, if no one has any additional questions, feel free to uh, contact me at the email address on the screen if you have any additional questions. Um, if you want to connect on Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest, or read my blog, uh, I'd be more than happy to have you. So I have, uh, I have a pretty open uh, policy for friending people on Facebook, so don't be shy.